I see uh, wonderful faces that I haven't seen for a while. Hello, Joe. Uh, hi. I see my friend Ruth, who, my Dutch friend Ruth from Israel. Don't see her, but I see her, that she's there. And uh, Sophia, so great to see you. Hi. Um, and Herb and all the uh, good people uh, in, in my life. So let us start. So, yes, the plan was last week to start this, uh, originally, to start this course. So what happened last week? Yes, I sent out uh, the email to everybody uh, before Shabbat. And then I noticed when I wanted to start the class last week, Sunday morning, that I got a message. There were too many recipients, and so uh, it didn't go out. So, um, but there were a few people who had come in. And so we decided after some talking to do a class last week on on poetry, but on not medieval poetry, which was the topic of the of this mini course, but on biblical poetry. So you can find this that on my website, shimondenhollander.com. You go to Jew Judaism and Jewish history, there you find uh, biblical poetry uh, among many other topics. And on top of that, there's a link to the video. So you can see that. It could be a nice introduction because, of course, that's the oldest form of Hebrew poetry that we have. So we're going to start now with post-biblical um, Hebrew. And the earliest example that we can, uh, that we can find is um, Yanai. Now, who was Yanai exactly? What kind of a person was he? When exactly did he live? Where did he live? Unfortunately, we do not have much of a clue. We have a bit of a clue. We know it was before Islam. And we have another clue from what community he was uh, based, on his, based on his poetry. Because the poetry, um, I'm going to explain that later, but reflects a practice. Uh, it's all, by the way, religious poetry. Later, you will see poetry that is, is secular, meaning it's going to be about love and about war and about drinking and stuff like that, um, wine. So, uh, no, Yanai is just only, and you see here the title is Yanai and Kalir. I'm going to hopefully get some more material on Kalir. don't have much, but that's at the end. I have a little bit of on Kalir. It's very hard to get your hands on it. Um, there is Hebrew in a number of Ashkenazi prayer books, but without a translation, and his Hebrew is pretty impenetrable. So, um, but we'll talk about that later. We'll focus on Yanai for now. So Yanai lived before Islam, we know that, and he, 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 his, his religious poetry reflects, uh, we know he practiced, a, um, his practice was to read the uh, Torah, not every year, as is the custom now, but every three years. Also, you might think, oh, there are people who do that. In uh, reform circles, they read the Torah in every three years. They read, of every parasha, one third. Uh, it's, it's not exactly the same practice, because uh, people who do that, they will go the first week of the year, Bereshit, and then Noach, and then Lech Lecha, just the first, they, they only do the first third, and the next year they do the second third. Now, this was in order. So, if you would say the first parasha is uh, Bereshit, they would the first do, do the first third, and then the second week, the second third, etc. So, they would take three years to really get through the year. That was, as is called in scholarly circles, and I don't mean this political at all, but it was called the practice of Palestinian Judaism. So I'm not talking about the modern sense of the word Palestinian, of course. Uh, so that has no implications. It's just that the Romans called the Holy Land Palestine, and up to the state of Israel, it's called Palestine throughout the ages. Not talking about a state, I'm just talking about the land um, and even, even very recently, um, Theodore Herzl had a dream to 
to establish a, a homeland in Palestine. So that is, is only a taboo word very, very recently. All right. But besides that, this is not a class on politics. So Yanai, we know that he belonged to that community, that community, uh, and, we, and we'll talk about that later. So this is all we know. We think, so he lived either in what was then called Palestine, or the Holy Land, so to say, or he could have lived in maybe the south of Italy. That's another option because the Holy Land was in the hand of the Byzantines. And so what was Palestinian Judaism then became, well, you could also call it at a certain point, Byzantine Judaism, uh, because those are the Jews who lived in the Byzantine Empire, at least in a big chunk of it. And so in Byzantine Empire, the Jews, many, most of the Jews practiced what we then quote unquote call Palestinian uh, customs. So in the South of Italy, also, there was a practice of reading the Torah every three years. Of course, that was not the only difference between Palestinian and Babylonian, the other community, Judaism. There were other practices too. Um, right. So let's just continue. So we have this like an introduction. We know a bit where he is. Maybe, maybe the sixth century, perhaps. So here I have a little bit of an overview of these two main communities. One is A and B. A stands for uh, Israel slash Palestine, and B would be B would be Babylonia. Right, so an alliteration. We're already in the mood of poetry. So what had happened in Israel? Just a bit. I do this for many of my students who have not as much insight in history as as you would have, um, and. Um, so just to have a little bit of an overview, around 740 before the Common Era, the Syrians took over, Babylonians around 600, and they took the Jews, um, the Jews, I mean, many, many Jews, uh, the most important part of the community to Babylonia. So now that's the birth of Babylonian Judaism. So therefore, it also starts at 600 before the Common Era. The Babylonians were taken over by the Persian Empire that started like 540 before. See, the Babylonians didn't last so long, about 60 years. Then they lasted longer, the Persians, then the Greeks came. So uh, Alexander the Great, so uh, starting with him, uh, around 330 before the Common Era, and they have the big impact on culture. Uh, for part of it, they also conquered Babylonia, but all right, uh, gradually, Persians came back, or about, see, Babylonia, the last ones, 245 BCE. The Romans, uh, the, so the Romans took over, not Babylonia, they never conquered that, but the Romans took over like uh, six, uh, 63 before the Common Era, which means, um, which means that um, at, the Greeks had been around for a long time. Now, the Romans turned into the Byzantines, the East Romans, around 330 of the common era, that's when Christianity took over. And so we have the, now that's the blue on the bottom, we have the situation that in, in the land of Israel, the Byzantines are ruling, which are really the Romans, but don't think that the Romans spoke Latin in most of, much of the history of the Roman Empire. Greek was still the, the, the cultural language. People spoke Greek at least. In, um, in, in, in official settings, um, and, and especially in the East. The East always remained uh, Greek-speaking. Those are those are Greeks. But Rome, whatever. I mean, culturally Greek, continuation of the Greeks, but also of the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire had absorbed the Greek culture. Uh, so that's in the land of Israel. And around the same time, the Persians are, uh, of course, um, the boss in charge of, of Babylonia. Good. Um, now, Yanai, so we think it is maybe the beginning of the 7th century, perhaps the 6th century, um, under Byzantine rule, and so probably in, in Palestine, but maybe the south of Italy, as I just said before. 
We do not know anything about his life, but he was a very influential poet that we know. For many centuries, his poems were lost. We're going to find out later why. But, um, you know, if you heard about the Cairo Geniza, which is an interesting lecture in itself, um, if uh, I, I could do that, but not now, the Cairo Geniza was like a holy dumpster, basically, of, of a dumpster of, of sacred, um, sacred uh, discarded texts, and, and more than that, just a lot of texts. Basically, anything written in Hebrew was, instead of looking if there's the name of God or any holy words in there, they just often just dumped it. We found so much about the, was discovered, it was closed up, but it was discovered um, in the 19th century, late 19th century, and we discovered so much. We discovered uh, pieces of writing uh, of Maimonides in his own hand handwriting, Yud Levi in his own handwriting, Sadiq own even. So, I mean, amazing stuff. A lot of the people we're going to talk about, we found their stuff. And we found some copies of Yanai's work. And that is how we, how we retrieved most of it. Most of it was lost. Okay. Uh, and why was it lost? I'll tell you, because, because the Babylonian tradition eventually won over, took over uh, all of Judaism. By the way, Maimonides was instrumental for that. He wanted one Judaism and he, and he promoted Babylonian Judaism. And he would not only him, his sons and people, his, 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 uh, his offspring were in charge in, in Egypt. So kind of sad that that tradition, and, and even though I very much are often on the side of Maimonides, but this is also a very uh, worthwhile uh, tradition that unfortunately is lost. Um, so because his poetry was so much geared towards that three-year cycle and it wasn't used anymore, his poetry was, uh, was not, that's one of the reasons, was not so useful anymore, so people stopped using it. That is one reason. Second reason was also there was a trend throughout the ages more and more to standardize uh, liturgy. So, um, so his poetry was made to insert in the Amida, in the, uh, in the, the main prayer. And so people say, have been thinking, and maybe Kabbalah is also a bit influential in that, but not only that, surely had contributed to it, is that, you know, the words are the words that you cannot change anything, not even a letter. So just to, we're going to see that in the time of Yanai, these prayers were very flexible. Basically, you had the final line of a bracha was fixed, but inside the bracha, you could add and you can change. And there was so much creativity there. And he actually tapped into that. But there was more of more of a dislike. No, the, the prayer should be standardized. And so, therefore, there are, uh, over the course of time, less and less and less um, creativity in the prayer. Um, good. So here we see a map of the east of the uh, Roman Empire and, um, and of the Persian Empire and the two big circles, uh, Palestine and Babylonia. Those are the main communities. Now, there's also a smaller, thinner circle, uh, the south of Italy. That's perhaps exactly as I said, when I, when I lived and especially Rome was also uh, had an important Jewish community. Um, so, but the south of Italy was under the um, uh, or under the influence of Palestinian Judaism. Good. Now, in Yanai's time, we get this is getting interesting. I think um, because it's it's always good to look at at uh, developments within the Jewish community, not as it is often studied in isolation. Oh, this rabbi came and that rabbi uh, made an innovation and that as if Jews lived as an, as an island and it's only an internal thing. If you actually have opened your eyes for the mostly the dominant culture that people lived in at the time, you will see that developments often are parallel with the general culture. So, um, that could be because of a zeitgeist, 
if you know that word. Um, so what's going on at the time, what's the trend of the day, so to say, uh, even though it's unspoken, uh, it's like an organic thing that happens in both communities. For instance, in the, in the 70s, you had in, 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 in Judaism, a, um, like a, a trend of liberal approach. Uh, you had Heschel, you know, um, was very much into society, human rights, um, and, and not focusing so much on the nitty gritty of the rules. And that happened in Catholicism and, and, and the 60s, 70s, maybe even the 80s still a bit. And in and Islam was calm, was like, let's just be whatever. But then, you, you, then we entered a, a time of a period of more fundamentalist approach. And it happened in all three religions, even in, in Hinduism, by the way. I mean, it's like a zeitgeist. It's like the trend of the day that often ha goes together uh, Cross religions. Now, what happened in Yanai's time? The Byzantine Church was very much developing its art and liturgy at to an unprecedented height of decorum and beauty. Now, you see here uh, an image of this Byzantine uh, art. Actually, this Byzantine art is in uh, is an image on the right, the, the photo on the right, of uh, a church in Ravenna, which is in the north of Italy. I had the pleasure to be there last summer. And um, because Ravenna was an important city of, Byz of the Byzantine Empire, even uh, so, even big chunks of Italy were um, part of the of the Greek Church, basically. Uh, not that they necessarily all followed that that uh, the the Greek or the Byzantine rites, but the the, the arts, etc. So there is um, Ravenna is one of the places where you can find really a uh, beautiful Byzantine art because uh, most of Byzantine area has over time been conquered by, um, by, by Muslims. And so uh, often these churches were turned into mosques, uh, uh, something was, uh, things were destroyed, etc. It's also, the Crusaders also contributed to that, but in Ravenna was never conquered. So it's still very much intact. On the left, you see a photo from a, um, a service, a uh, Byzantine service. You see there's a lot of glimmer and glitz and beauty and this. And this is not only that, this is also in the liturgy itself, in the, in the words of the liturgy and in the music. And so what happens in Christianity is now happening in Judaism too. And Yanai is a very strong example of that. Uh, as I said, Jews are always influenced by their surrounding culture. So and beautification of prayer and liturgy in the general culture is highly valued. Let's make it beautiful for the Lord. Let's, okay, well, we are Jewish, but we don't want to be, we also want to be beautiful for, for God, you know? It's not that we want to be less than the, than the non-Jews, we want to do it at least as nice. So then it's no surprise that Jewish liturgy developed in that direction as well. So, for instance, I'll give you a, um, just a little uh, treat of an impression of, um, this is actually an Aramaic song, a Christian song, uh, but it is, um, it's a prayer I think I have. I made this quite a while ago. I think there's even subtitles to give you an idea of the choirs and, and the sounds um, to, to get you in the mood of, because we don't know. We, we think that a you know, nice music might have been sung by, um, by uh, and maybe there were choirs involved. So, uh, so we can only guess what it sounded like. But let's take a guess and listen to, to this.
Okay. Some other uh, some differences. So the Babylonian Judea, uh, to the Jewish community, of course, uh, wrote and and developed the Babylonian Talmud and studied that and had their religious instructions from there. Um, and the Palestinian Judaism had their uh, what we call the Jerusalem Talmud, which is not written in Jerusalem. That's why. That's why scholars sometimes call it the Palestinian Talmud, but they have to watch out when you say that nowadays. Um, Babylonian traditions in prayer were different. Uh, uh, where, well, no, they're not different. That's what we used to now. It's standing with your hands together, let's say clapped like this uh, on your heart so it was to, to, to um, symbolize the idea of a servant. Now see on the very left is a Babylonian statue from the pagan period and this is how people used to worship in babylonia even before judaism so very interesting this might be a um, continuation of a very old practice um uh, not that the practice came from paganism it just in the culture this is a respectful position and people would wear leather shoes why not right but the Pal palestinian judaism would um, at leather shoes in Babylonia was seen as something really fancy. Oh, you go on a on a visit uh, for very, uh, to 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 the king. You wear nice, beautiful, comfortable, fancy leather shoes. But in Palestine, Palestine, they still had the memory of the temple and of the temple service, and so um, they would take off their their sho their their shoes. Because in the temple, you wouldn't wear shoes. Yeah, it's like what, what God said to uh, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground what you're standing on is holy. Uh, Babylonian Jews never done that. They weren't in holy, they were in exile. They weren't on holy land. But in Israel, they felt this is holy land. When we serve God, we take that off. Um, also, uh, they would bow down during prayers on certain moments. Um, also, Babylonians were very much into uh, aware of demons. Palestinian Jews initially less, but later also um, will continue. Here, uh, the Babylonians were under Zoroast uh, Persian rules. The Persians were Zoroastrians, and um, at, while the Babylonian, while the Jews in in land of Israel were under Christians, and often the Christians were more. Uh, let's say, um, oppressive than the Persians, not always. The Babylonians had a strong belief in demons. They had all kind of, uh, and that is connected to Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism divides the whole world in two groups of forces, the good and the, and the bad forces, and everything, uh, things physical are often of an evil, so uh, a, a, a demonic. So let's say you cut your nails, that, or, or, or you go to the bathroom, everything that leaves the body, blood, uh, nails, hair, if you cut your hair, that, that was uh, seen as attracting demons because it is low. It is something that is uh, degrading or uh, not as, as elevated anymore. And so the idea that this, this whole bunch of laws connected to, in Judaism too, how to cut your nails and that you... Some people we burn them or bury it or, uh, or or flush it through the toilet or not and wash their hands after they touch their nails. Um, that is absolutely clearly Babylonian origin and um, extension of certain types of ritual purity um, in the Bible, in biblical law. You have uh, the monthly period of separation between husband and wife is that in under normal circumstances, unless there is a irregularity or a very extended period of blood flow for the woman, that is like, say, not normal or something to look into, to be worried about. But normally, uh, from the day of the beginning of menstruation, that is the first day, people would separate seven days. At the end of the seventh day, if everything was over, they would... Um, Woman would go to the mikveh and dung. In Babylonia, the Zoroastrians had much longer periods because they had this idea that blood leaving the body has, uh, attracts demonic forces. And so in order to purify for it, 
They had the idea that Ephraim is over you wait the whole week. And that became the Babylonian tradition for Jew, Jewish women too, because wow, we're, we're Jewish. We're at least as, as, as strict as these, as these Zoroastrians. So we're not going to do less. So that became the custom in Babylonia and we're stuck with Babylon Judaism now. So now we have extended periods of this ritual purity. That is part of Babylon Judaism. Palestinian Jew, Jews didn't do that. Right. Okay. This is not really poetic, but okay. Now, um, but still, you want to have an idea of the community that he came from. Okay. So in Babylonian Judaism, this uh, idea when you wake up, you say, Mode and Lefanecha, that is a uh, late a late introduction. That is not what people used to say. They would say, Later, they stopped that because they, the idea of purity and, and, and this, th there is I'm probably jumping ahead really a lot. But as we, as I mentioned, this, um, uh, so the idea of demonic forces have, um, in, in certain strands of Judaism have uh, penetrated. And so the idea was, became current that, um, that you had to be pure, purify your hands before you pronounce the name of God. Otherwise it's like two, two different forces. You, your hands are, are impure when you sleep. I don't know where that's from, but there is, and it's probably also uh, maybe Babylonian origin. So people started saying, no, no, you have to wash your hands. So when you wake up, you cannot say Elohim Neshamah anymore because it's the name of God and you have to wash your hands first. So they would then postpone that blessing and say, Modern Ani Lefanecha. Why? Because Modern Ani does not have the name of God in it. Uh, but originally they would say, my God, the soul you have given me is pure. You're created. That's the first thing you say when you wake up, even before you open your eyes. Um, that was it. Palestinian Judaism had a much more efficient and short uh, blessing. They would say, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, hametim, who gives back life to the dead. And um, that is uh, easier to remember, for sure. So there's a little difference here. And because it's an interesting difference, I... I, I like to share it. In Babylonian Judaism, as I said, and now we're getting uh, somewhere, there's a one-year cycle for the entire Torah. Palestinian Judaism, a three-year cycle. Um, no, I'm struggling some, sometimes with, um, with, you know, um, on, uh, it's a whole different thing, but I am recording uh, videos of uh, liturgy and also Torah reading. And when you do a whole, and also sometimes when I learn an aliyah or very rarely the whole parasha, but on occasion I've done that. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure and a blessing to be able to do that. But if you want to really pronounce it, and this is the idea to really pronounce the Hebrew correctly with the accent on the right thing, with doubling letters really clearly doubled, et cetera, et cetera, with all the alas pronounced and, and the haze and, and stuff. Um, it would take long to make it beautiful. It takes long. So what you have, what you have is we have such a big chunk that people say, okay, people sitting, people think, well, the, the, the congregation is sitting in service so long that just read it a bit faster. And then what happens is uh, you speed it up and it doesn't become as clearly, okay, you do your duty. So if you have a shorter, let's say only one third, or just two aliyot, the size of two aliyot, two, uh, two, two readings instead of seven, um, then you can take your time and you can pronounce it really nicely and clearly. So, so I would be a fan of this three-year cycle for that reason. Of course, it takes a long time to get through the, through the carbonot of... Uh, by Ikra and stuff, that would be a bit harder. But, uh, okay. Under Byzantine rule, the Palestinian Jewish community was the first to develop liturgical poetry for the service called Piyut. The ba Babylonians weren't so into that. They were more like, you know, uh, please, um, no, no, no extra brushing up. But then again, they were not on the influence. They were not in the society, the, the Byzantine society, where the zeitgeist, where the, 
where the, the trend of the day was to make it be- more and more beautiful, to impress people with the service. They're like, just pray, simple, no, the bit. So that, that's why the Byzantines were the first to, to do this. Um, wait a second, Simon, Simon, yeah. wait a second for a moment. You mentioned that you were in favor of a three year cycle because of the way they pronounce the words. Does that mean that they read less? Uh, on a, when yeah, yeah. I've explained that in the beginning before you were there. They, they, they took three years to read the whole Torah. Right, but they took three years from what I understood you saying because they pronounced each word. No, no, they read more, because they read less. They only read a oh, third okay. of what we read. And then you have more time to take your time to pronounce it uh, well. That's what I meant. Yeah, I see. No, I probably got it wrong. I'm the one that gets. No, no, that's okay because you asked the question. Now I now I'm sure that everybody understands it. So okay. And and when you have a question, then then it's very. There's always a a, cha- a, a, a real chance that other people have the same question but are afraid that's to right. ask. They always wanted to know, but were afraid to ask. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. The Palestinian Babylon cultural discrepancy, right? That that was it. The religious leaders, the Go'onim in Babylonia, were uh, opposed to this trend. Now, Yanai's work is the oldest known Jewish poetry after the Bible. Uh, for the first time, we see Hebrew poetry with end rhyme. We saw last week, for those who were there, and, and for those who want to watch the video, you're welcome uh, to do that. But that, that biblical Hebrew has no end rhyme. And if there is an end rhyme, it is uh, coincident, purely coincidental, um, but except for the fact that there's certain sounds that are repeated, but it's not really about the end rhyme. So, um, but now we see end rhyme in Yanai. He's the first one to introduce that. Um, and he's also, uh, he, he, used, uh, he, used, he, he used his name <clears throat> in the, um, so he signed his name, meaning he spelled his name. So you might have a poem that the first strophe starts with a, with a Y and then an N and then another Y. So Jan, he would spell Yanai basically in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in his poetry, which other people, many people did later. Yanai's time, especially in Palestinian liturgy, standard prayers of Judaism were not yet fixed. There was still much more room for creativity within the liturgy. For instance, the most central prayer in Judaism consists of 19 benedictions on weekdays and seven benedictions on the Sabbath and on holidays. In our days, these benedictions are written in a prayer book and read in exactly the same format at each year because the standard IG can print it. But there were no uh, no prayer books yet, so it had to be by heart. And uh, so the Chazan would be somebody who could not just read well, he had to memor- be able to memorize well. In Yanai's day, the final line of such a benediction was prescribed, was fixed. But the words leading up to this final line were largely flexible. As long as the general, <coughs> the general message of the, of the blessing was maintained. For example, the first benediction had... Uh, had to end with the words, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. The second ended with, who revives the dead, Mechayeh HaMaitim. And the third, Ha'elah Kadosh, the holy God. But those were the fixed, the fixed uh, parts. What, we're going to see what he does with these blessings. It's really interesting. And excuse me. <coughs> and I used the available space within this prayer service, and he wrote poetic embellishments, for these first three benedictions, always for, the, always for the first three, he composed different poems for every Shabbat and holiday. So every Shabbat had, was, had a different prayer. And in these poems, he made connections to the Torah portion that was read on that day. So the prayer has a connection to the parasha, basically. Now, keep in mind, as we said, that in his tradition, the Torah was divided over three years. Let's say it's not 50 uh, weeks uh, and then the Torah is read. It's three years, so it's 150 weeks, minus some of the holidays, which had their own liturgy. But let's say somewhere between 120 and 150 different Shabbatots, different Shabbats. So he had different versions of the liturgy 
let's say, more than 120 different versions of the liturgy, and everyone is very intricate. Now, that becomes interesting, I think. <clears throat> Such a composition for the th first three benedictions, as Jan I wrote it, was called a kedushta. Kedushta is an Aramaic word. It just means the same as kedusha, meaning sanctification, sanctification of God's name, calling God kadosh. But it's because it ended with the word ha'el kadosh. That's the end of the third benediction. Therefore, it all led up to that final word. That's for the whole compilation of, of, of poems was called the kedushta. Right. Um, yes. I said this with my own words regarding each kedushta, you would think consists of nine poems. No, uh, of three poems. No, nine poems. The first poem belongs to the first benediction, the second to the second benediction. And then there are seven poems that are dedicated to the third benediction. So the kedusha part is really uh, quite elaborate. So let's go to... So the, the, the first poem of the Kedushta is because it ends with Magen Avraham, the shield of Abraham. It's called the shield, the Magen, uh, because it ends with that. So that always has the format of a half alphabetic acrostic, which means it, the beginning of every sentence is with an Aleph, then with a B and a C and a D, maybe an Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, the first 12 letters of the alphabet, Aleph through Lamed. <clears throat> and this Magen is divided into three stanzas. Each stanza, of course, because there's 12, has four rhyming lines. You're going to see an exa example here. I, 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 I took uh, the examples from the parasha that we don't have anymore because we have different parashot, but... Um, it's it's from the from the from Genesis where Jacob lives with Lavan with his uh, father-in-law, and he's now told by 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 God to go back. Um, so that and um, why did I choose that one? Because that is intact. We have very few uh, kedushas that are intact. A lot of them are de degraded, and so it's really interesting to to see a whole kedusha. So this is the kedusha that starts with uh, thirty-one. Uh, verse three, and um, God says, "Go back to the to the land of your birth, to uh, Canaan." Yeah, Omancha uh, bekerev rochokim. So the first three, if you see the first eight, actually all in red, have the um, end with kim, but the root is resh het kuf, so which means far. So here, I, let me use my mouse. Resh um, Chukim. Here is it. Uh, here it ends with Chak, Merohak, Rahak, and here it is with Shuv. So the first, me, the central meaning of the lines is that he is far, right? This is all far, and at the last, the culmination of the Magen of this poem, Shuv, Yashuv, Yeshu. That means to go back, to return. So you're far away, Jacob, now return. And it's, uh, you were going to see that this is all focused on Jacob, but not just Jacob. Jacob's the second name is Israel, or was going to be Israel. And that is also, we are Israel, we are the people of Israel. And what's said to Abraham is also said to his offspring. The people are far away, they're in exile. And God is going to say, at a certain point in time, hopefully soon, return. Now, that is the underlying double message. It's about Jacob, but it's also about the Jewish people who are oppressed by the Babylonians and who want to go back to their, to their house. But they're not allowed under the Byzantines to live in Jerusalem. It's a band. It's banned for Jews. Right. So you see here... Um, this parallel, first on the, on the very right, you see the, the alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hebav, Zayin, Het, Tetyot, Kaflamet. That's always the Magen. Um, good. So you see parallelisms here. Your ways, the beginning of the, the first strophe, uh, your ways and parallel with their path. 
your ways, their path, ways and path. Um, but your ways bring near those who are far. So this is good ways. Their path keeps them from evil far. So this is goodness and, and evil are opposites. Those driven to wander away so far, exiles among people who reject you far flung. So those driven and exiles is also uh, a parallelism. The man, the pure man, that is a appellation for Jacob, flee, fleeing the man of rejection, and that is Lavan. So there's a there's a these two lines. Indeed, like the pure man who was near but had gone far, he's near to God, but he had gone far. He's far located, fleeing, is removing himself from the man of rejection. That is Laban. The person who, who does not want to be near, who re rejects God. This is the lad bequeathed to him. Return to it. He spoke to him and compelled him. He says, remember, the land, the promised land where we're, not, where we're far from is really ours. And God eventually wants us to go back. You decreed empty-handed he would not return. That is Jacob. And you declared, parallel, decreed and declared, a remnant will return. Ah, the remnant that always goes is about the Jewish people. So it is Jacob who was going to return, not empty handed. And the remnant, which is the Jewish people in exile, they will also return. Though the storm of the hairy one approached like a dragon. Now, does anyone know who the hairy one is? Hairy one is uh, somebody with a lot of hair. Tell me. Esau. Very good. Very good. Very good. Um, and why Esau? Aesav, in poetry, in the whole, through the Middle Ages, stands for, originally stands for the Edomites. In classical time, it stood for the Romans. And then the Romans turned Christian in the Middle Ages, the hairy one, and Aesav, and Edom, all the same. It's all the same thing. Stands for Christianity. So the storm of the hairy one approached like a dragon. That were, those were the Byzantines. To the smooth one, that is Jacob, who doesn't have all this hair, you said, to your portion return. So hairy and smooth, which means Esau and Jacob, also a, um, a, a, a contrast, which we saw. Those are themes from, as we saw last week, some of them, as themes from biblical poetry that are taken into this, uh, carried on into this poetry. The last line of this half alphabetic acrostic always holds a key from the first First of the weekly Torah portion. So it, the first verse is, return, the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your ancestors and to your birthplace and I will be with you. So this was Parashat, parashat Shuv. We don't have that parasha because we have less parashat, but for them it was Parashat Shuv, part of the parasha of return. And so it ends with return. So go, go back, you see the last line, ends with Shuv, with return. The reports that say return, as it says, and now comes the first line of the Torah, return to the land of your ancestors. So this Magen poem has the theme of the first of the first verse, and it ends with the key word of the first line of the parasha. And then it and it also has some other uh, text from from the prophets and from the Psalms. As it is said, a remnant shall return, a remnant of Jacob to a mighty God. So the first line of the parasha is Jacob. The Isaiah text is the land of, is the people of Israel. And then you have uh, Psalms, all right, which say somewhat the same thing. It continues, and he confirmed as a decree for Jacob, for Israel, as an eternal covenant. Eternal covenant is berit olam in Hebrew. And olam means eternal, but also means world. The first uh, word of the last quote of the verse is olam. And that was the, the Magain's finale. The world, Olam Yisodach, Benita Bahazdach, Memagain Bene Hasidach, Baruch Atadunai, Magain Abraham. So the world you found it, you build it with your love, you shield the children of your lover, which is which is Abraham. Blessed are you, the shield of Abraham. So from the world, from Berit, from the from the um Returning, uh, it's your, and the returning is your eternal covenant, your land. Now the word covenant, eternal covenant, berit, olam, the word olam, meaning 
worlds. It goes to worlds. He created the worlds. And, and so he ties it into shield of Abraham and everything from the beginning to the end is one uh, is connected to each other. So this is the first of the nine poems. Now we go to the second, which connects to Mechaye Hametim, the restorer of life, who resurrects the dead is another word, right? So it's called the Mechaye because that is logical, right? That's the, that's the key word of the, of the final line of the Baracha. It also consists of a half uh, alphabetic acrostic, but now the last 10 lines, because the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. So the first acrostic had the first 12, and now we have the last 10, but it's also 12 lines. So the last two lines are used twice. So the, so it's from Mem to Tav. So the Sheen and Tav are used twice. So we have 12 lines and also the same pattern. So let's go here. This is from the same Kedushta. Um, queens among his treasures. These queens are his wives. The pure one's wives, his treasures. Loyal to him like sheltering walls, the structure of his dwelling standing in support. Meaning these, these women, they really support his household his, and, and the people, the mothers, uh, holy mothers of the Jews, of the uh, people of Israel. Mindful of what had been revealed, he joined them and to them he revealed the end has come, the return from exile, hopeful that rebuke be revealed. So meaning rebuke for the enemy. So we're all, they're all, they're not thinking Jacob anymore. They're thinking them, you know, they are in exile. He perceived Jacob again, that the matter was urgent. He sent for them while he waited outside. Pure and wise women, free of disdain, the pure one in his wisdom, Jacob, called them to counsel. Um, so he also uses a Midrashic material, by the way, very frequently. Here, the last line of the alphabetic across it holds a key word, the word call, see? The pure one in his wisdom called him them to counsel. And that ties in to the second verse of the parasha. Then Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock. So the last line of the Kara'am um, here, Leot's counsel. Leot's is interesting. It's an unusual word. Um, so the last word of the second poem has the key, ends with the key word of the second verse of the Torah. Gets more and more intricate. Um, so, because the second one is, then Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the flock. As it is said, daughters and queens are among your treasures, Psalms. Your consorts sta consort stands at your right hand, decked in the fine gold of Ophir. Um, and so there is, and then here, uh, Psalm, now, now Micha, the prophet, he has told you, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord seeks from you. Nothing but doing justice, keeping loyalty and walking humbly with your God. So this is what we have to do in order to merit the redemption. As it is said, the Lord is mine. I fear nothing. What can a man do to me? Uh, the word man is the last line. And that ties into the finale. Man and beast you save. O God who saves. Life-giving do you pour over us. This is also a theme of the Machayim team because not only uh, is God praised in the second bracha for reviving the dead, it's also for giving a new, new beginning after, after depression. And it's also in nature, God, even in, depending on the season, but you also thank God uh, and, and praise him for either rain in the rainy season or dew in the in the in the warm season so you save life giving do you pour over us blessed are you o lord who restores life to the dead so the word man ties into living creatures it connects it to the nature and then it ends with the um, with the final blessing of the second bracha um, so we saw two two of these um, now now let's do the first one of the, we have seven more to go. 
So the third poem is called the Meshulash, which means the third. And we'll just do that one, and then we'll uh, continue next week. God willing, it's going to be the middays of Pesach. I hope people are available. And uh, But if not, watch the video. We're going to, I'm going to redact it, and you can watch it. The third, as I said, is Meshulash. That is the first of the seven that conclude the third uh, benediction, the Holy God. Now, we're going to go into the concept of holiness. That wasn't really uh, addressed yet. The third is also an acrostic, but not alphabetic. This is an, is an acrostic of his name. So here's where he spells his name. So th it has four rhyming couplets. It spells the name Yanai. Every week he made a poem with his name Yanai. 150 different versions of this all connected to the, the rhyme of this third poem is more rapid. It has a, a beat, basically. All right. So this is about fear. You see here on the right, the, this is uh, in red, Yod, Nun, Yod, Yod, which is how you spell the word Yanai, Yanai. Uh, okay. Fear and awe. Uh, he uses the word fear in uh, interesting ways because fear could be being afraid, but also could be uh, God-fearing, which means actually respect. Fear and awe are nothing for those who fear you. You don't have to be afraid of anything if you fear God. For fearing you, in fearing you, all who oppose you are like nothing. Uh, and it rhymes, of course. Yira umora, lirecha ayin, ki bir atach, kol nevdach ayin. All right. You say to the man who feared, meaning the, uh, the, the God-fearing person, of what are you afraid? What, are you what do you fear? How can a God-fearing man fear someone who doesn't fear? So how can a God-fearing man be afraid of somebody who doesn't uh, respect God? He feared you in his own land, meaning had respect for you in his own land and outside the land as well. It's not that he left the holy land. Oh, this is the land of God. Now I'm somewhere else. Let's live it up. No, he was still respectful for him. Um, and in old cultures, in, in antiquity, uh, gods were often perceived as being connected to a certain land. And if you left, that was it. You know, you couldn't serve God. Then you had to know the God of, of, the, of the land. No, Jacob didn't do that. You fulfilled his desire. God fulfilled Jacob's desire. And you kept his counsel. Oh, Lord, you send him a foot back, uh, back to his birthplace, to his tranquility, to his serenity, sending him home. Okay. This continues, I think. Oh, no. Is this it? No. The message of the third poem ties in to, ah, so the last one, this is all, no, not the last line. The whole theme of this one is fear. And why fear? Because, because that ties into the Haftarah. The Haftarah is a prof prophetical reading, which is a different one because, of course, they had different Haftarahs, Haftarot. Uh, but this Haftarah that they used, uh, connected to the three-year cycle, started with the verse, as for you, have no fear, my servant Jacob, says the Lord. Be not dismayed, O Israel, for I am here. I deliver you from afar with your descendants from the land of captivity. So this is about the people in captivity too. Jacob shall once again have serenity and peace, and nothing shall make him tremble. So this is beginning of the Haftarah, and that's why the Meshulash has the theme fear. As it is said, erect markers for yourselves, Set up signposts, so basically make a highway, or this says it here, make a highway, uh, the path that you walk. Return, O maiden of Israel, return to these your towns. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. That is always the end of the third poem. O God, may you be revered forever. Uh, so it's 10 o'clock. We'll, we'll continue with the fourth poem of the Kedushta next week. How is that? But um, let's let's have some some. Uh, if there's anything that you want to bring up or or ask, maybe we'll do that now um, at the end. Is there anyone who has something, a burning desire to ask a question or to say something or to uh, ask for some clarification? I don't hear anything. You can always press. Can I have a question? Yes. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, I found in 
some Sephardi communities, it's a tradition that each time they read the psalm or, or any passage, that they repeat the last line, but the congregation repeats the last line. Did you find this in, in your research? Oh, that we don't know, because we don't know. Uh, we, this is, um, it could be that, let's say, at the end of this, uh, as you have so often, this is like a, a line that was said every time. I can imagine when people's, can, people were in anticipation of the, how is the Chazan going to tie, how is Yanai going to tie in the, the parasha into the spare this time? And they knew the structure, they knew the third one has Yanai, and they knew the ending, they could, when they start uh, the end, they start, um, they, they already were here, they already know fear, oh yes, of course, that's, uh, that's the Haftara. And then he starts saying a few lines, and then they know, that these final lines that are always said every week are coming, I can imagine that they, that they join in with the final line that they know. Well, they but nobody it. has a they prayer book, it. so it's only the ones that are familiar and know exactly, can feel when the end is coming. But that's not recorded anywhere, you know. Uh, but I can imagine that things, the final blessing, maybe they would say amen or they would say it together. We don't know what their custom was so much. At least I don't know, maybe you know, or someone else knows, but uh, about what was said by the congregation. Basically, all these things are different every week. So, and people had no books, so they had no idea uh, what was coming. They were just listening. Uh, and it's a great stimulus, stimu stimulus to start learning the Hebrew well, so you understand the poetry, because that's the pleasure of this kind of liturgy, but the last lines come back every week. And so, yeah, people probably would, would uh, pike, pike in with that. that. That would be my imagination, David. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Joe. Hi. This is a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank and you. I'm wondering whether it's really wonderful. And I have a couple of people who are not congregants at Sheriff Israel who might really enjoy it. Is it possible to? Of course. Them? I send oh, it to uh, to everybody on my list. So who's not? There's not only for congregation. If no, no. So you send send them the link if they want to be. Uh, you can also send me their email addresses. I'll put them on the list. But also this one, um, I will this week somewhere this week send out also link to the video so they can actually see this uh, class too and not miss it. And uh, so we'll have a little course there. You can look back one day. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Shimon. Okay, Joel, so nice to see you. Class. All right, so then we'll conclude the class for now. And um, we will... Uh, yeah. uh, ben, yeah. Ben, I was, I was wondering why you have nothing to say. Well, it's not that I have nothing to say. It's that I know. maybe what I have to say, the others shouldn't hear. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, you can always hang, hang on and everybody signs out and you say it to me personally. Yeah. Okay, I would like that. You can do that, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, always, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a blessed week. Have a good luck with the preparation for Pesach for Passover. I hope you have a very blessed Passover with inspiring conversations, hopefully, and nice people around. And um, and I hope you can make it on uh, on Sunday if it's busy and, and you know it's a busy week, but. Uh, if not, watch it another time. I'm, I'll, I'll send out the links. But I hope to see at least some of you and maybe some people who aren't here. And I'm looking forward and we'll continue at least another uh, eight, nine times. Yeah. All right. Lovely. Everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.